And now we will start officially. And so it is my pleasure now to introduce to you the gentleman who sits on my left, to your right, um, who we've already gotten to know, I think, uh, briefly here, uh, our Professor Liam Lefferts, uh, for, uh, retired from Drew University. And of course, a long-term um, co colleague of many of us here in Singapore. He uh, published a chapter in our book on Earth and Where in Southeast Asia, which the Southeast Asian Ceramic Society co-published with NUS about 12 years ago. And of course, that means already, he had already been working on the subject for about 20 years of that time. And so, finally, I think he's approaching some kind of a conclusion. <laughs> he had that end the Louis Court. Yes. Uh, of course, Louis Court is part of who is also a curator at the Fear Sackler Gallery, Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. Um, the leader has been here for almost a year already. He went to the Asian Civilizations Museum, where he has one of these uh, long-term fellowships that we give out one or two of, well, we don't give the senior fellowships out very often. We give out visiting fellowships at the ACM. Professor Wang Wu and I are on the selection committee, which had nothing to do with the selection whatsoever. <laughs> we did everything by the book. Of course, we're extremely happy that he's here this year, and he will now be sharing with us the very fascinating results of this ethnoarchaeological research on pottery making in mainland Southeast Asia. This is one field that I've been working on also since I taught at Kajamata University in Georgia. I used to teach a, a whole course on ethnoarchaeology. And it's still by far one of the most neglected areas in the study of material culture in Southeast Asia. There's a little glimmer of help back there in the 80s, early 90s, but now, what used to be that at the annual meetings of the Indonesian Archaeological Association, maybe 30% of the papers would be ethno-archaeological. Um, but now, there's almost no ethno-archaeology, and it's almost 30, or maybe 50% cultural resource management, because that's where the money is. It has to do with tourism. <laughs> <laughs> so ethno-archaeology is this uh, kind of rating that's gone up, and now it's it's declining, which is really unfortunate because a lot of these traditional practices are disappearing. Pottery making is one of the most endangered of these traditional occupations in Southeast Asia. It's one of the most important because it's one of the hugest quantities of data we have from pottery. Um, one can still find various parts of Southeast Asia, of course, uh, uh, where you can see more or less traditional methods being used. We went uh, with this ceramic society a, a couple of years ago to Yangon and Tante. And we saw the pottery making there is still you know, going on today, but already that's changing gradually. You can see the technological and the economic shifts taking place in areas like the Mekong, the uh, Irrawaddy Delta. Anyway, what Datum what is doing is extremely important. And uh, you know, uh, 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 we'll get to up to date accounts of the state of the art from Datum now, but the pots and archaeology and, and people. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Now I have a microphone. <laughs> um, this, this paper is actually the paper that Louise and I presented, first of all, in London of, about a year ago now, and then just a, a month or so ago at the, uh, at the ACM uh, as a part of their ongoing lecture series. But since John couldn't hear it then, right? You were, you were traveling someplace, and other people were away. There was a demand to give it again. So I'm giving it again, but, but, but John extracted from me a promise that I would do something more than just simply repeat so something that two of us have given and and I incorporated what I want to add to this in the flyer that went out and on the handout that you have here I want to emphasize or I want to pull out I want to make sure that you get from this talk three items here that is the nature and method of the research the research methodologies that we've done here we think are significantly different from most archaeological, even anthropological, they're, they're almost, I would I hesitate to say this, but at the cutting edge of contemporary research, how are you going to get movement in your materials? How are you going to show movement in your materials? And, that's, and you'll see why as we get there. Because obviously people move when they make pots. They don't stand still for one photograph and then move, 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 like, like you see in photographs. So as one kind, I hope it's seen, as one kind of ethno-archaeological method. Then I want to move from that to a, reasons for the stress on embodied behavior. I, I tend to think that we, especially sitting here in an air-conditioned room with the light
lights on and looking at pictures tend to intellectualize what we're looking at. And it, indeed, in talking with the people as they're producing these plots, it's not that they don't know what they're doing, but their bodies know better what they do. Okay? And how do we get at that? How do, how do we get at that embodied behavior? And to our mind, to Louise's and my mind, this embodied behavior is indeed the most cultural aspect of things. The intellectual talking about it is in some sense a kind of tip of the iceberg to how you drive a car. You can't describe how you drive a car at work. You drive it or you have an accident. Okay? And you learn to drive it in your body as much, especially if you have a gear shift. Many people don't have that anymore, so they don't really know about how to shift gears. It's a real problem trying to teach people how to shift gears. So I want to put across this embodied idea here, and I have a reference for that. Matter of fact, some very good studies are being done about that with regards to the issues of material objects. And then finally, the, and this is at the end of the talk, the impact of these findings on understandings of accepted Southeast Asian linguistic, political, social organization, and other of the usual kinds of map, map boundaries that you, that you see. Because what we come out with, to put it simply at the end, is a very different map of Southeast Asia than people are used to seeing. And, and the question is just, how do we make sense of this map vis-a-vis -vis all the other maps that you've seen? Now, I did a preamble uh, here, and I, and, I, and I want to go through that very quickly to introduce you to this. Um, I, well, first of all, I want to thank the ACM for letting me off for two hours so I can come up here and do this talk because we're in the throes of uh, finishing up a book on another, another kind of uh, embodied behavior uh, and, and what that means and that sort of thing. So it's very, and that you'll see more of that later on. Not here, but later on. I want to say thanks to John, of course, long-term friend. No, 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 no. It was nice talk you gave about <laughs> well, thank you for coming being back. a gorilla. I call it gorillas. You can take gorilla. I think you want to speak Spanish. But anyway, if you say gorilla archaeology, uh, I, I very much approve of that. In some senses, I think Louise and I have been doing a gorilla ethnoarchaeology. Because we go out, we do the research, and then we we'll get yelled at by the government. You should have been here. He said, we're just driving along, we saw the lobby, yes. <laughs> and, and, uh, and of course, the ICs. Um, so, one of the things is that, for me at least, archaeology is very much in the context of anthropology. I, I don't see archaeology as a separate free floating discipline. I hear if I, and I, that the, one of the issues, of course, is what's the theories, or what are, what are the theories come from that drive archaeology? And one of the basic ones, and this is indeed one of the major impacts that archaeology has on the rest of anthropology, is the concern with material culture. Material culture, that is things, things. And when you talk about ceramics, you're, you're talking about a thing or things, right? And so what we need to do is, is be sure that we grapple with these things and how to work with them and how to understand them. And I think that archaeology, in the context of anthropology, gets at this. Archaeology can be called the study of remains, okay? That we're wondering to talk about. But I would prefer to talk about the life history of things. In other words, these pots got produced. How were they produced? Okay? Do we know how pots are produced today? Okay? What's the and what's the meaning to the production, if there are any meaning to it? This is the way we, most of the time, this is the way we make a pot. Well, over there, they don't make it that way. Oh, well, that's the way we make it here. We make it here. Uses and meanings. Well, how are these things used and what do they mean? And then finally, the discard and those meanings if you go after your garbage archaeology out there in, the, out there in, the, in Singapore, <laughs> garbology. Okay. Um, did you know that term before? We have it. We have it. There's a good set of articles on garbology. Okay. And I, I really like the Georgia talk. On focus on objects and places. In other words, material culture. The focus on the objects, that is the things and the places, um, and, and that create and then are created by the people. In other words, it's an interactive process. We could almost say talking through things, or talking with things, or things talking to people as people talk to things. And the reason I put this banner up here, this scroll is, is what I'm working on at the ACM, and indeed this scroll conduces to certain behavior on the part of people, even at the same time as the people themselves create the, the scroll, okay? So how, the question then becomes, how are we able to see production and use in something once the thing is discarded? How can we go back 
to those previous things. Now, we're doing work on this card analysis. That is, um, I forget the term for it. Anyway, how things are, to find me, right? How things are laid down. Why did it end up that way in the garbage pit as opposed to some other way in the garbage pit? Is that indeed a very interesting end point? But then go before that. How is the thing actually used? Well, we're, we're trying to get at that. Well, how is the thing produced before that? As I say, all of this is a life history. So how are, th how are we able to see production using something once that thing is discarded? And this becomes really important when we get the pots, because I want to show you that not all pots are made the same. Not even in sound, especially in sound. So here we have, now there's some things I want to sort of push aside. First of all, um, one of the things that we've had to grapple with in our study is, well, the pots here are, are, are stamped. They have a cord marking on them, or they're incised or something like that. And the pots over here aren't. So that shows that these pots are made by one kind of people and that pot's made by the other. Well, when you go out and talk to a potter, and you say, uh, do you make, you, you do this, do you make stamping on the pots? Hey, do you want them? I'll do it. There it is. <laughs> oh, no, no, that's not what I meant. Do you do it as a normal part? No, well, if you can want it, we'll, we'll do it, you know. If you don't want it, we won't do it. So it's, you know, all this stuff, excuse me, this is not to say that, it's, excuse me, what are you going to attach your studies to anyway? But the question is, we see decoration as quite ephemeral to what we're looking at. And that's been really one of the shockers of our study, okay? That, that indeed, that, 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 that what we think of as decoration is ephemeral. But four may not be as ephemeral, but the decoration may be more ephemeral. Then the other thing is the issues of locational constraints. Sometimes people will say, well, look, the potter's over here. It had to be different from the potter over here because the paste over here includes uh, sand. And over here it includes, uh, includes a carbonized um, rice grain or rice husks. Uh, therefore, we're working with two different processes. Well, that may be basically a function of whether there wasn't any sand available over here. Okay? In other words, they just they have another way of doing it. If you can pick the sand up and use the sand, you'll use the sand. Otherwise, they use this. Is that indeed an issue of what the people want to do versus what the people have to do in order to make a pot? So, in other words, what what we're trying to get is some some long issues, some de issues of what we might call deep culture. What about the object is relatively long term and cultural? That is, in some senses, traditional. Uh, the, that is the result of human action. Okay. So, pots are they easy or not? I, I'm, I'm a little. I don't know. The pots are so easy to to, to do, but um, it's anyway. It's what we can work on. Um, there are a couple of other phrases that, that are of interest here, perhaps. Well, Joyce White has made it very clear that when talking about Southeast Asia, prehistory and early history, and maybe even to the present today, if we really examine the nature of what goes on in people's lives, it's not a hierarchical system. It's a heterarchical system. That is, different people very close together could be doing very different kinds of things. It's a very complex this doesn't mean they don't relate to each other and exchange each other and all that sort of thing, but it could be heterarchical. And on your on your handout, on the first page, second page, I put down two sources, one of which is George White's article on incorporating heterarchy into theory on socio-political development. And this article has had a uh, a real a real um, impact on how some people see Southeast Asia. Other people are pushing saying it's extremely hierarchical, you're missing the point that indeed uh, things came out of China, and that's the way it worked, and all that sort of stuff. But there's, there's another story which maybe it's heterarchical. Ref thus reflect on what it means for that potter to be a potter in his or her cultural context. And then the other thing is this whole issue of embodied behavior, relatively uh, and, and Josh, I don't like to use those terms because it makes it, makes it into itself a hierarchical dichotomy. And the work of Tim Ingle that I cite there on the page on the anthropology of skill, uh, a wonderful article beyond art and technology. You, you know that, John? Mm -hmm. Oh, it's a really wonderful, and I have it on PDF in this computer if you want it. Um, and I'm happy to put it out. Um, because what it says is when you, when, you know, you, you think about, you, you ask an artist, why do they do what they do? Well, he's forced, he or she is forced to intellectualize because he has to respond verbally. But they do what they do. Okay? So, so maybe maybe we're forcing it there. Maybe we should really be looking at the 
doing of the thing um, as, as important. And uh, so I, I, I think Tim Ingold's work is good there. This is not to say there are others along the same line, but good in that respect. 